no surprise many people rely on going on vacations just to have some kind of happiness in their life or people rely on going out and drinking themselves into a stupor it's, it's the common thing because we are so not built i firmly believe we're not built as a human being genetically to live in such a rigid structured way um, so as a result we control everything the only way you can function in a way where everything is so controlled in your daily life is to control everything is to not allow yourself emotional freedom but this is not you being human actually it, a human being naturally has all these emotions that arise and yes we need to manage them but trying to control them to me is a problem because if you're trying to control them you're not really honoring what's happening with you Hi, and welcome to the Mindset and Performance Podcast. I'm Dries. I help athletes and business professionals with their career development. We work on a wide range of areas from psychology to strategy and execution, but we focus essentially on the mindset as it is the key to everything else. The whole idea behind this podcast is to deconstruct the habits that led people to their success, to learn from their experience and understand the psychology behind their actions and behaviors and of course, to gain key insights that you can apply to your own life. How well you do in career and life is highly dependent on your emotional management skills, whether it is at the office, in sports, or in relationships, being able to have excellent emotional intelligence is crucial to your success. In this Mindset and Performance podcast episode, Bernd Windhofer, and I hope I'm pronouncing it well, Bernd, shares with us key insights about how to improve your general well-being in a fast-paced world that never actually rests. Bernd is far more than just a yoga teacher. He gives yoga classes, meditation classes, and yoga teacher trainings, and, and more. Bernd teaches at Desaseni, a village resort in uh, Bali, Indonesia. His style is quite unique, his people like his classes because of the way how he sequences them, but also for his approach to teaching. And he, he likes to give his students a lot of freedom to modify and adjust their practice to suit their own needs. He is um, significantly influenced by Eastern philosophy um, and Bernd formed himself through the years by continuously learning from his teachers and mentors and being there curious um, and wanting to learn uh, more and more. Having lived actually in very culturally diverse countries, Bernd blends multiple approaches to serve better anyone who would like to be healthier body and mind. And Bernd wasn't always into yoga actually, in fact he is, his beginnings were in music and theater. It's only through his teens that he started the interest in the Eastern way of doing things. He played martial arts and mastered his skills to become a teacher at a very young age. Uh, in this podcast, you will learn the importance of acknowledging your emotions, the different emotional management techniques, how to manage your emotions effectively, what, what's a tantra, uh, how to stay focused, the power of meditation, and how to navigate through emotionally challenging times. I have known Bernd for about five years now. I first met him in the yoga studio. Uh, what I specifically like about his approach in his, in, in, is his actually down-to-earth style, fluffy. <laughs> he uses humor and often quotes his own teachers. His sequences are often intense physically, which is something that I actually like. In uh, his practice, we usually required to pay attention to our breath and there are always lessons and key insights that are beyond the grounding physical benefits of the yoga practice that I carry with me through the day. Right, so um, enjoy the podcast and take notes. All right, we are recording. So how are you today? I'm actually pretty good. I'm pretty good. Yeah? Yeah. Have you been teaching this morning? 
I taught a class uh, a couple of hours ago. It was an hour and a half class where I made everyone work very intensely in the forward bending aspects. So they were doing a lot of bringing their body closer to their legs and even their legs around their head, those kind of fun things. So an advanced class, an advanced yoga class this morning. It's often very fun for you. I know that because I noticed you take pleasure at seeing us suffering. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but I do take pleasure in making you do things that you have no idea how to do and then trying to navigate your way through them. Yeah. And you, usually your classes are quite challenging, I would say. Like, yeah. I don't know, I, I haven't been to so many... Um, morning sunrise uh the ones mm. that you do at 7 or 8 a.m yeah, those like are that. a bit softer yeah they are okay mm. i usually come at the ones at 10 which are usually the challenging ones yeah they're <laughs> challenging both the hatha ones and the vinyasa mm. are flow ones were there a lot of uh, students today yeah yeah we were, we were sold out i was booked out we had 34 people wow. um, already 10 minutes before so we had to close uh, early as in didn't let anyone through anymore okay which is a pity some regular students couldn't get in but Mm. It's my busiest class. This class on a Thursday is uh, what's called Vinyasa Flow Lab. So we do, I do a class where I really zoom into one particular posture or family of postures or kind of style of posture. And mm. then we spend an hour and a half working in that direction. So we often go very deep and often very intense. And it's, it's, a, it's an advanced class. People mm -hmm. come to that if they've been practicing for a while. And what, what's the purpose of this sort of uh, classes? Well, it's really, once you've got a pretty decent practice already and you want to go deeper, it's a great way to explore that because many people are kind of, kind of only a fine practicing kind of on the surface level. So they're um, kind of brushing the surface of the posture rather than really going deep into it. And in the Thursday class, we spend an hour and a half like today working with the forward bending aspect. So you're folding your body over your legs, um, which is quite interesting. You learn a lot physically in terms of your legs and your back. And emotionally speaking, the old tradition of yoga say that the forward bends are calming and softening, but only after you've opened up the body. Until then, they're a bit stressful because you don't feel particularly comfortable with the hamstrings being yeah, yeah. really stretched and, and the back kind of achy. So these classes act as a forum to go far, far deeper, often in one aspect. Like last week, we did a lot of twisted type postures um, within arm balancing context. And that, again, was different. So it's kind of getting a chance for the student to really go deeper into one particular direction, which often has quite interesting physical, mental and emotional uh, effects. What's the feedback usually from your uh, students? Do you from do you that have class? yeah from yeah let's let's pick that class first yeah it's very positive feedback people always mm. really enjoy that class in particular because first of all it's a lot more challenging than pretty much most classes around mm. um, and a lot of advanced yogis in Bali are looking for something that's a bit more difficult and they like the fact that it's a really challenging class because. A lot of classes are just kind of open level. Mm. And those, if you've been practicing for 10, 15 years, start to get a little bit like boring, <laughs> to be frank. So they're looking for something harder. Um, they also really, people generally enjoy how I sequence them. And I tend to try to sequence them in a way where I quite carefully build step by step in the direction we are traveling. So you learn a lot about your body in the process, a lot of tiny, tiny detail in different muscle groups. Mm. So... Those are the two main bits of feedback I get. Um, mostly people enjoy the difficulty and they enjoy the detail they get. From. Mm. Are they mostly um, regular uh, students? I would say in that person? class, probably 90% regular, 10% wow. walk-ins. Mm. But most of them are, are people that I've known often for years, mm. actually. Well, I think I've known you for five years. I think so. Yeah, since yeah. I came. I mean, yeah. and since then, I'm not trying any other teachers. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very true. Kind. It's very kind. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's funny. My view on teaching is always like, uh, of course, there are some teachers that are more skillful than others. But beyond that, it's just we all have teachers we gravitate to because uh -huh. we like an approach. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I'm better than someone else. It's just that my approach resonates with some people. Absolutely. Whereas other people resonate to other approaches. Like if you want a nice, fluid, happy, dancey yoga, you don't come to my class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you want to go a bit more in-depth um, and uh, explore postures that are a bit more challenging, maybe, then you might come to my class. But it's it's really if you like the philosophy, you come to my class. If you're not mm. interested in yoga philosophy, then probably I'm not your teacher mm. because I try to bring depth into my classes. And if you come just for fun, then maybe 
Again, another teacher might be better for you. Mm. So it's really positive, actually. There's no such thing as the best teacher. There's just the right teacher for you at this time in your life. True, true. And you know what? Let's pin that one. I want us to go back at some point to the approach, the philosophy, mm. the why behind it and the purpose. Okay. And um, I'm curious how how would I present you? How, how do you actually present yourself? To people? Like, do you see yourself as a teacher, a yoga teacher, or something else? What's the label you put out there for yourself? That's an interesting one. And you've asked me at an interesting time because I'm really going through a whole revamping at the moment of mm. what I'm going to be offering, especially next year. Um, I don't have a clear answer to that. Definitely not a yoga teacher. Uh -huh. I don't see myself just as a yoga teacher. Nothing wrong with being a yoga teacher. But um, it's more that, uh, I don't know if there's such a thing as a label, but what I'm trying to do at the moment is integrate all the teachings I've studied and practiced and then offer them as a way to help people develop. So ideally, I mean, it's funny, actually, pretty much all my long-term students so far are all interested in using the yoga modalities of physical practice or meditation or breath work or study the, the ancient texts. They use it as a way to try to make their lives better, to get clearer about their purpose, to get clearer about their day-to-day -day life, to have better relationships. And that's the way that I want to, to offer these teachings. So yes, yeah, sometimes I put on the hat of yoga teacher. Other times I put on the hat of kind of a coach even, I guess. Um, people see me one-on-one -on -one in that regard sometimes. I don't have that formal approach, but people use me in that way sometimes. Um, sometimes I'm just uh, trying to help you find what the point is of your life. I mean, mm. it, it's so that can be there too. Other times people want to pick my brains about meditation. Then I'm the meditation teacher. So put on different hats. But my ideal situation is to really help people mm. in their life in whatever way they need help. If I can help, I'm really happy with that. So it's hard to kind of pin down. I guess any out of any of the labels, maybe just generally teacher is probably the best. Mm -hmm. But even then, it's not perfect because I don't want to just teach. I mm -hmm. want to help you develop. Not just mm -hmm. give you information, but help you find some more depth in your life. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Uh, right, right. It does make sense. I mean, it's a pretty broad yet specific somehow. Right. It is. Well, it's specific in that I have the tools that I have. Mm. You know, I'm trained extensively in the yoga practices, in the philosophies behind it, um, in the meditation world, of course, both in Buddhism and Hinduism. Um, but then also I have a big background in the acting industries and in singing and in theater. And I, wanna, I try to bring that all in as well, in music. Mm. So um, it's like my aim is always to try to bring all of my various skill sets that I developed over the last 40 years of my life um, into something that I can offer to people. So it's kind of specific in that I only have a specific skill set, mm. but it's broad in that the overall aim is just to help, mm. <laughs> just mm. to help people in their life in whatever way I can. Mm. Would you be able to articulate if people ask you, okay, you're a teacher, what are you teaching? Can you articulate it in a short, concise sentence or is it like more, it has to go through different levels? Uh, to be kind of slightly dodging the question, I would see who's asking the question yeah. <laughs> and frame my response in a way that makes sense to them. Mm. Uh, for example, I had the question recently, that very question for someone I just met, and they were very much coming from a normal modern city business situation. And I said to them, I teach meditation, philosophy, and yoga. Mm. And they got that. And it's true, I do. Yeah, People who are... Different, I might say something different. Mm -hmm. Or I might change the order. If someone really wants to work with their body, I might even say, I teach yoga, meditation, and philosophy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it kind of depends on the person. But it's the same thing. I teach the same thing, but it just depends on who's asking. Yeah, it does have to. That's actually what I do also. When, uh, it depends on people who are in front of me, how I introduce myself to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it can be very abstract for some. And then if I use different terminology, different words, it can be more specific and more yeah. clear for some. Yeah. Would you mind uh, walking uh, the listeners and myself too um, through the, your earliest chapters? Like, um, let's start, for example, where are you originally from? Oh, originally from Austria. Mm -hmm. um, I was born there in 78. Um, and I spent the first nine years of my life there. In Austria? Yeah. So you speak German for sure? I do, but it's not that great anymore. I'm pretty uh -huh. rusty. I mean, I left uh -huh. Austria in 1988, and that's a while ago now. Yeah, right. Wow. So that was about 21 years ago. Mm -hmm. like 31 years ago 
yeah, 31 years ago. You still have attachments with the country? No. Go back sometimes? Never? No. no. I've been back every now and again. Um, yeah. I don't have any huge attachment to Austria uh, because I haven't lived there. But in a way, that's not that indicative of anything because I don't really have a huge attachment to any place now because I've moved so often in my life. I mean, I've lived in, I mean, after Austria, my family moved to Australia, but then after quite a long time there, I moved to Singapore for a few years. I moved to London for a few years, spent some time in China, India, and now Bali. So the result is that I don't really feel like I have a home country. Wherever I am at the moment really does feel like home. This feels like home at the moment. But mm-hmm. if you put me back in Australia or Austria, I'd be like, uh, why am I here? This, yeah, right. this is not my home. Uh-huh. What does what what makes a place home? What usually think? What do you think a place makes makes it feel like home usually? To me, it feels like home right. if uh, I am doing things there and in a living situation that feels like home. So, mm-hmm. for example, Bali is home because I have people I care about here. I have my dogs here. Um, I have uh, my work here and my home. So it's home. My mm-hmm. house is home. Mm-hmm. Um, if I was to you know, move to, let's say, Alaska for a job, I'm sure within a few months that would feel like home as well. But okay. it's, it's, it's like that. It's, it's really mm. work and family life, I guess. Is there any uh, specific elements that are very important for a place to be called home for you? Like, for example, for me, uh, I would feel more um, home if, when, place, when there is ocean in these places. Ah. Not at all. I mean, I've lived in big cities, I've lived inland, I've lived on the ocean. Mm. Because I, my, my work and my life doesn't really revolve around any geographical mm. location. Mm. Not really. If I had to be asked at a stretch, I could say, funnily enough, living in Bali, I feel a little more home around forests and mountains than sea. But it's very small. And that's only because I grew up in that environment in the first nine years of my life. Mm. But actually, to be honest, it doesn't really make much of a difference. It's just a little thing that if I had to choose to live by the ocean or in some beautiful mountainous territory, I'd choose the mountain and the lake over the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and who were you as a kid growing up on all these places? God, um, I was a very intense child. Very intense. <laughs> in what sense? Well, mother tells her, my mother tells a really funny story of, um, I'm not sure what age I was, I think four or five. Um, living in Austria and I had just discovered for the first time that there were starving children in Africa. The children were dying because they didn't get enough food. And I looked at my plate and saw too much food that I couldn't eat. And I got really upset about that. And according to my mother, and I have a little rem- little recollection, a little memory of this, according to my mother, uh, I spent I think two or three months not sleeping crying every night, nightmares every night because of the thought of these poor children in Africa who couldn't eat. And I felt like it was so horrible and so stupid and so unnecessary. You know, another example, a few years later, I started learning piano. You know, and um, I remember vividly, it used to drive my parents crazy. I would play the same passage again and again and again, hours on end until I got it right. So I was, I was completely stubborn. I would not let it go. And You know, my mum used to say, my father as well, they used to sit there and they'd go crazy. They'd hear the same damn mistake again and again. And then finally I got it right and they were just so happy. <laughs> so <laughs> Does was, that make you move to the next thing? <laughs> yeah. Well, once, once, I, once I could do it correctly a number of times in a row, I move on to the next passage. But it was really intense. Um, uh, teenage years the same. I was always a very emotional child and really felt... Uh, a lot of suffering around me from the beginning. I think a lot of, in fact, my, a lot of my life is, has come from the fact that I'm very sensitive emotionally to people around me and to myself. And um, I don't, I just wasn't doing well because I couldn't cope with all the suffering near me. So was, as a result, kind of became very introverted, very quiet, very withdrawn. Mm-hmm. And uh, who influenced you the most during that whole period? Like, I, ha- I had actually two questions coming in mind at the same mm-hmm. time. Who influenced you? And also, if you can recall, who did you want to be mm-hmm. or do? Mm, interesting. It's funny, really. Um, the influences that I've had in my life have always been not really anything contemporary. Like, I don't ever remember in my life having seen someone alive today and thinking I want to be like that person 
or I, I, I really that person's amazing. It's always been more like reading accounts of these crazy ancient sages living in the mountains, these wise men and women walking around the forest, you know, um, teaching. Or, or as a kid, I was a lot influenced by these ideas of these kind of uh, quite crazy kung fu masters in China, and you know, and, and they would have these students. And so this kind of thing I found really, really interesting. Um, What did they have? What was specifically, or um, yeah, that, that you would would have liked to acquire or learn from them? First of all, it was their pure independence, mm-hmm. so utterly self-sufficient. They didn't need anything or anybody. They were completely happy in themselves. Um, then it's also the way they just lived in such a free, authentic, spontaneous way. Like there was no kind of rigid. I must be like this. It was just their ability. All these ancient sages and these yogis and these kung fu masters—they all have that same quality of, they just live 100% as themselves, and um, I found that so interesting always. And, and you know, it's funny. As a kid, I read a lot of novels and mostly fantasy and science fiction and that kind of thing. And again, it's it's the it's the old wizard. It's <laughs> it's the old master that was that that's a stereotype, the archetype that I found so compelling. And that's no surprise then that I based my life around these yogic teachings and these meditation teachings. Yeah. Now though, but like, how was uh, your early adulthood? Well, early adulthood, it was. Oh, it's very funny because I was kind of just following along what I thought I should do, and I didn't know what to do. I felt kind of lost, so I was kind of just doing what I was good at, which was music. You're talking about twenties? Um, no, this is actually still late teens. Mm. Um, and I went to university. I did a degree in classical music, playing the French horn, working in orchestras. Oh, that really? Kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. Um, but through all that already, I started the martial art training when I was sixteen, and I started teaching that within a year, I think, uh, as well. And um, that was the most interesting part of my life. I remember very, very, very vividly uh, doing the whole. Um, music thing playing in orchestras but always itching to get back into the the training hall and and, and training martial arts once again um so that but then i thought well i can't have a job in this so i guess i'll just keep on doing my music and i did like it i mean i love i love music i love anything that's emotion driven and mm-hmm. i was playing classical music classical so, yeah. yeah so it was like symphonies and concertos and 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 really, just loving the feel of this rich old tapestries of these symphonies that I was getting into. Um, but then, pretty soon, I started to realize that wasn't quite right. And in my early twenties, what I started exploring then, this is already around when I started the yoga practice. I started yoga practice. So I think I was twenty-two, just turned twenty-two. Um, around that time, I realized actually playing as an orchestral musician wasn't really right either. So I started training more in theater and in in uh, singing as well, and that was already a bigger fit. That was already better, and I was able to then tell these great stories using my body as the medium and my voice, which was already much much closer to what I wanted to do. But even then, something wasn't ever quite right. And looking back at it, even though I spent many years fighting teaching, I didn't want to teach. I said, "No, I'm never." At one point, I remember saying in 2004, "I will never teach yoga." <laughs> and a year later, I was teaching yoga. <laughs> <laughs> so I was fighting it, but that's always where I felt the most comfortable when I am teaching. You know, there's that saying in the the horrible saying, which I these days feel to be wrong, but that's go that goes around a lot in the professions of acting and music and singing. Which is that those who can't do teach, those those who, who can't, can't do. do, who cannot do mm. teach, and that's kind of the assumption. And I thought that was the truth. I thought that was the case. So I must actually do, not teach. Teaching is just a second-rate job. I don't want that. Mm. But of course, that's rubbish. That's not the case <laughs> at all. Teaching is a very noble profession. So um, I came to realize that more than anything else that I've done in my life so far, teaching is my most natural fit. I quite like it. I, not quite. I do really like passing some kind of knowledge on, passing mm. some kind of tools on to to others that help them. Mm. So it's it's really quite funny looking back at my life how things progressed. There's always this desperation to be a successful actor, and I did well. But I wasn't famous. I did well to be a, a musical theater person, to theater, TV. I did all those things, but really all the way through, my main interest was always in 
the yoga stuff. The, the, I was learning Sanskrit quite early. How did you get introduced to it in the first place? That was funny because I had finished my martial arts training recognizing, I think it was about 20 or so, recognizing that this isn't long-term feasible because I was injuring other people. What were you doing actually? What kind of it's martial arts? It's called Ninjukai Taijutsu. Ninjukai Taijutsu. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like, many people have heard of Ninjutsu. It's kind of like that, but it's older. Uh -huh. But similar sort of thing, ninja stuff. Right. Japanese right. martial art. Uh -huh. um, and uh, yes, I was kind of really... Uh, you were injuring out. people. I was injuring people. Because what I realized was... Um, <laughs> I was causing others harm and then I was causing myself harm. At the time I was still trying to play French horn and often we'd get busted lips and then how do you play French horn with a busted lip? It wasn't going to work. Black eye is not good for the acting industry. To turn up to an audition with a black eye isn't really going to work out unless it's a very specific role that I didn't go for. So I realized this has to stop. I have to find something else. Um, but I have to find something else that I really find as interesting as martial arts, that's as physically challenging. Because the thing I loved about the martial art, it was physically getting me very fit and it was really interesting and compelling. So I was doing it a lot and getting a lot from it on a deeper sense. The philosophy, the, the stuff behind it was rooted in Taoism, which is such an interesting philosophy. So um, after some serious searching, two different people in two different parts of Australia where I was living at the time, both suggested seeing this one teacher, Gregor, Gregor Mela and his wife, Monica, Monica Gauci. And these two are just wonderful uh, yoga teachers. And um, Gregor's written, I think, five or six books by now. And he, and they're both teaching internationally all year. They don't no longer have their own school. They're, they run some retreats from their house in New South Wales, in Australia. But... Um, they, from the beginning, uh, changed everything for me because I had the impression that yoga was something not very interesting, maybe for people who were wanting to just kind of lie about and do some stretching. I didn't really know anything, but I had tried some yoga and it was okay, but it didn't really, really fascinate me. And these two different people who I both respect quite a great deal in Australia both suggested trying to see Gregor and practicing this form called Ashtanga Yoga. We just had some bad press lately, but I mean, aside from all that, which I completely empathize with, the, the actual system is, it's, it's a good system, I feel, for, not for everyone, for many people. So I decided to give it a go, expecting nothing, thinking, you know, well, this is just going to be whatever. Um, it might just be boring, it might be easy. So I turned up to this little yoga school in, in South Perth region, Western Australia. And from the first session, I was really captivated by the work. The teacher, Gregor, was just wonderful, very funny as well, and, and really uh, a practicing yogi, first and foremost, who then teaches out of his practice. And it was apparent from day one that this is who he is. The practice itself was really physically tough. I couldn't do it, but I wanted to learn to do it. So I was motivated to practice. Physically, I realized the body had to go under, undergo some serious changes to do this stuff which I love the challenge of. It had the same element of challenge that martial art did without the high impact element that got me and others into trouble. Was that the drive? The drive was a challenging part? One of the drives. Mm. But the other underpinning that really made all the difference is the philosophical context. Mm. I was just going to ask you, sorry to interrupt. Mm. Uh, the, uh, it seems like there are two very different practices, like the, the act, acting and, and uh, music. Mm. It's quite different than the uh, martial art and the yoga. It, it is, is it, right? I guess I'm so. Correct, eh? Yeah, you, it's quite accurate. Not 100%. Uh, no, but they have elements that... The elements that both have is mm. they both require you to connect very deeply to who you really are. Right. If you don't know okay. who you are, your acting is right. going to suck. Mm. And see. yoga is not going to be authentic. Mm. <laughs> okay. Sorry, keep going then. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you, so you were, you, were uh, um, you practiced with her, you saw the challenge in the uh, practice and you wanted to learn uh, what she was. It, it's well, a she, right? No, Gregor is a guy. A guy, okay. He's a man and his wife is Monica. Uh -huh. um, yeah, but both, both of them, I had them, uh -huh. I worked with them both over the course of the first um, few months of, 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 first few years actually of practice. Uh -huh. So I really wanted to go into that, um, and I found it very interesting also, that's what I was going to say, because of the philosophical underpinning that this wasn't just a physical training, whereas the martial art was learning how to fight, but the martial art we were training in had the underpinning of learning how to live using the Taoist philosophy, 
we were studying the Tao Te Ching, this wonderful old text, and using that as the baseline for what we were doing. The same thing with the yoga. It's like I was doing this challenging physical stuff that was having a definite beneficial effect on my body. But then I started to realize the benefit is even more pronounced in my thinking, in my emotional life. And then I started to read a lot more widely into where this stuff came from. What are these practices? Where do they come from? And that's the process that really I've been undertaking ever since. We're talking, what, nearly 19 years ago now, and I'm still undergoing the same process. I'm still constantly uh, reading these texts. I mean, I, I, had to, I started to learn Sanskrit maybe eight, nine years ago now because I realized I wanted to study the ancient texts, not just in translation. All these things kind of took me down the path I'm going in now, which is using all the old, wonderful wisdom teachings of these beautiful traditions in a very practical, modern way. Mm. So that's what kept me hooked. It started off being the physical challenge, but very quickly I was just so interested in this big, broad sense of how much depth there was mm. to this physical practice. In pursuit of? Well... Uh, to the traditional answer is one that I resonate with, which is complete freedom mm -hmm. from all the stuff that causes you suffering, from all your bondage, from all your pain. Right. Freedom from feeling trapped right. in your own life. Mm. So that was the uh, second shift in, shift in moment, pivot in mm. moment, I believe, from yeah. the story you said, like that, this one. And there was another one before it when you said, like, I can remember vividly how I was... Um, uh, I think it was on your late teens, right? That's the second pivotal, pivotal moment. How many pivotal moments actually oh, you I'm had? I'm not really sure. Uh, many. <laughs> many. <laughs> I mean, first first came my, the recognition yeah. that I was deeply affected by suffering. Yeah, right. Uh. And really that changed my whole life, actually, uh. from, from an early stage. So um, what age where are we talking about here when you said, okay, you started like learning a lot about the philosophy, the yoga, the... Uh. Well, that's probably, I would say, all happened or began really fully through my 20s. 20s, okay. Yeah. And a bit of personal background. My family raised me in a completely atheist way. My parents are both physicists, both have PhD in different physics, theoretical and geophysics. Um, and when asking them as a kid what happened when you die, I was told that you just end up dead in the ground and the worms eat you and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was quite shocked by that answer everyone else was talking about God and heaven and mm. my, my, my mom and dad just thought that was ridiculous and were laughing at the whole concept um, so from an early age I, something didn't quite feel right there but I didn't I wasn't raised in any way that was religious so I didn't have any any kind of answers so I suspect a lot of my searching for philosophical systems has come down to that too the recognition that something in my parents view didn't quite fit and so I did a lot of work on studying philosophies, I think, also in part to find meaning. Mm. And I do resonate so strongly with the old Indian and Tibetan and Japanese and Chinese systems because they seem to hold answers that I can relate to. Mm. So that vision of rotten and the ground changed right now? Oh, completely. Completely, yeah. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. Completely. Okay. So how long have you been teaching yoga now so far? I started teaching part-time in 2005. Mm -hmm. So that's 14 years. Um, again, never intending to teach. Small groups, some corporate, some private. What were you thinking back then? Like, out of it was just, I'm going to practice this. This is fun. Mm -hmm. Or is it like, I know specifically what I want to do with this and how, where I want to take it? I felt like when I first encountered yoga, this could well be a lifelong practice for me. I didn't want to teach it. I wanted to use it for me. I wanted to deepen the practice for myself. I wanted to use it as a way to discover what life is really about while being, you know, the well uh, successful actor and musician and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I quickly realized that was a very silly view. Um, so their whole initial thing was this for me and then very quickly I started to realize actually I need to share this stuff because my one of my big big views in life really is you, you have to really do what you're most passionate about and, and build your life around that and it became pretty apparent that the thing I was most interested in was all that side of things it mm -hmm. wasn't the acting as mm -hmm. much as I love Shakespeare and I love the words and the music and the singing mm -hmm. it wasn't what really really kept me hooked in my life every moment that I had spare I was reading ancient texts I was you know learning Sanskrit studying the Yoga Sutra studying these Buddhist texts you know Obviously, very passionate about it. 
Yeah. yeah. You know, oftentimes in, uh, in the classes with you, you often bring up uh, mentors, what they told you, mm. what you learned from them, yeah. what they said during their practice. My question is, like, who influenced you the most among all these people? Maybe it could be one person, could be many people. And why? There's a few. I can uh, think of probably three that are the most influential. First uh, is Gregor and Monica together. But um, although I love them both dearly, probably Gregor had more of an effect on me. So Gregor being my first yoga teacher, and he had a huge effect on me. His whole view of practice is so wonderful. And, and, and I mentioned him a lot because he was a big, a big um, influence. Also, the reason I mention these guys a lot is not just to kind of name drop, and not at all that. In fact, it's part of what I feel quite strongly about as a teacher that I don't want to pretend it's my own teaching when it came from someone else. So if I mention someone else, often I want to bring a teaching out, but I didn't make it up, so I'm not going to pretend it's mine. So I say, as Gregor used to say, do 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 um, the other big influences uh, at the moment very much is Reginald Ray. Reginald Ray is now at the time of this uh, recording. He's 77 years old. Um, he has a group called Dharma Ocean. Um, there's been some controversy recently, but that's another whole story. Nothing sexual or physical, no abuse, nothing, nothing like that. But there's some stuff. But aside from all that, um, Reggie is just one of the most inspirational people I've ever come into contact with his um the way his formulation of the tibetan buddhist world his formulation of meditation is just very 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 interesting and i'm endlessly inspired by it. and the other the third would be uh, a teacher who's who was given a buddhist name in the 60s or early 70s um, called vajradaka he's now in his late 60s i believe living in london english man and also just a wonderful wonderful meditation teacher and one of the things he does a lot, uh, he works a lot with creative people who are having kind of blocks, like writer's block. And he uses the meditation teachings to unlock their creativity. Mm. He's got a, um, a, interesting. A, yeah, a little system he calls creative engagement. So it's um, so these are my main three, I would say. Probably the big three with many other lesser influences. But these are the big three. Gregor, Reggie and, and, and Vajradaka. Very interesting. And can we then speak now about your own practice and what, what, what do you think is different about it? I mean, like self-assessed, self-looking at what's different about your own practice than other yoga teachers' practice. I guess. I mean, for me, I can answer that because I, <laughs> I see from the outside. But I, I'm interested to know about your own view. Yeah, it's a good question. It's kind of hard to 100% answer because that presupposes my knowledge of everyone else's practice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I can tell you what I do and what I feel might be a bit different to others. Um, I very seriously have taken on one of the old teachings that we first encounter in the Taittiriya Upanishad, which is a very, very ancient, we're talking multiple thousands of years old text, Indian text, called the Panchakosha model. And the Panchakosha model means the five sheaths, the five layers. And the concept is there are these three outer layers and they're all called different bodies and then two inner layers. And what the yogi tries to do is pierce the three outer layers to get to the two inner layers. And then those two inner layers lead one to really knowing who we are. Three outer layers, are to, to not bother with Sanskrit, go straight into the English translations, the physical body, the energy breath body and the mind body. So the physical body literally translates as the food body, actually. The Anamaya Kosha is the food body. And it's muscles, bones, tendons, sinews, all that stuff. Now the asana, the yoga posture practice, tries to go deeply into that layer. It tries to sort that layer out. It tries to iron out tensions, holding patterns, physical, physical dimensions of emotions, all the stuff that we hold in the body is the purview of the yoga posture practice. So I'll do my yoga posture practice as often as I can. Pretty much every day. Every now and again I don't, but usually every day. Um, five, six days a week. Uh, but that's not enough. If we just encounter the body by itself, we are missing all these elements. Now, the second layer is the one most modern people find hard to accept, but it's pretty clear that it's something that we need to consider when we start practicing, which is a pranamaya kosha, which is the, the energy or the breath body. Now, the teaching is that uh, in the Taittiriya Upanishad is that uh, we aren't just body and mind, we also are energy. If what the Chinese call qi, Japanese call ki, what the Indians call prana, 
what you might call life force, what the Star Wars fans might call the force. You know, it's an <laughs> underlying animating energy that the body has. And we can feel it quite often, like as a kind of tingling, vibrating electricity even. And it's interesting, when you do a lot of yoga posture practice, you start to notice often different parts of the body suddenly start getting hot, like kind of very deep internal heat. I mean, this is all prana, this is all energy. And that affects everything. I mean, it's really interesting that many modern Indian authorities in yoga in India today even say things like pranayama, the practice of working with the breath to manipulate energy, is the primary practice for health, for immunity, and for mental health. Because that body of practice is just to sort out the energetic aspects. You might be physically really happy, mentally you have some good ideas and views and you're pretty clear, but something's missing often. And in the yoga world, we tackle the energy side with breath, with breath work. Pranayama literally means extension of life force. It doesn't mean breath control. That's an erroneous translation. It comes from pranayama, which means prana energy, ayama extend. So my practice already has those two elements. You have the daily physical work to iron out all the body stuff. And then you go one layer deeper to the energy stuff. And that's breath work. That's a whole range of, a whole sophisticated range of breathing techniques. There's some modern systems too, like breath work is the famous one today that everyone starts to do. Um, but really, it's great actually. But there's, there's many other systems where one just uses the breath to really work with your energy. Even on a purely prosaic level, people who are always tired find pranayama gives them more energy. People who are always manic find pranayama settles down their energy. So even on that level, on a prosaic energy level, it helps a lot. Um, and the third sheath of the, of the five is um, the um, mind body, the manomaya kosha, and the mind sheath. And that's, of course, where meditation comes in. <laughs> mm -hmm. So my practice, as much as possible, looks like working with all three as much as possible every day. To be fair, I do practice meditation seven days a week. The other is only five or six. That's largely due to physical constraints. And I'm aware that a body needs a break <laughs> once or twice a week. So the muscles don't get overly fatigued. Um, but um, So when you say practice, when you say your own self-practice, or are you mm -hmm. talking also about it extends to your teaching when you're in the class? It of course extends but, to teaching, yeah, right? of course. But yeah. it's especially my own practice. Because when yeah. I teach, I don't have time to do all those things. Mm. So in the course of a 90-minute or 60-minute flow class, there's only so much I can bring in. But what you have noticed, I'm sure, and I know you have, you've talked about it before, and what many of my students notice is that I always try to bring in many elements into my teaching. So even though you're doing all the postures, you're going through all these asanas, I always really work in detail with what your breath is doing. I'll always work in detail what your awareness is doing. Mm. So even though you might not be going home to meditate or doing a dedicated breath practice like I do, you will still get a lot of benefit by working with these two layers also. If you're doing your, you know, the funny thing is actually every single aspect of yoga practice has to have the others in it. For example, when we're practicing meditation, of course, we have to be aware of our body posture. And of course, we need to be, we need to ensure at a minimum that the breath is moving free in the body. So we're sitting in a way that allows the breath to move. And many meditations even use the breath as an object. No. So um, when I teach I don't have the luxury in a regular class to go into those two layers in detail, but I do bring them in as part of the practice, always. Yeah, I have noticed. Yeah, that's yeah. why I like the class. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm particularly also interested in knowing how this approach in, in the philosophy, how, I think you mentioned it in the beginning of the conversation, and we said we're going to pin it. How can it help the modern society uh, navigate through the challenging times? Mm -hmm. You know, like I work with athletes and uh, business professionals, and oftentimes we work on emotional control and try to teach them how actually to control their feelings during intense periods of time, whether it's like uh, at work or in a competition, sports competition. And um, I'm wondering what can we say about it? And by the way, saying control and emotions, is it the right thing to say? Say the word I'm control? I'm not a big fan. I'm not a big fan oh. of emotional control. It sounds a bit like a, you know, you're being a dictator over your own yeah. <laughs> emotional oh. life. You know, I, I don't want to be a Mussolini <laughs> <laughs> to my emotions. Yeah. Um, 
uh, what's another term you might use? Uh, emotional management. Uh, management is a lot better. I prefer that. Mm. Um, or even emotional awareness is good, but not quite enough. Or the emotional development. I think emotions are a funny thing. Um, the modern world, the problem is that we set up society in a way that's very control based, that everything is so rigid, all our scheduling, you know, we know what we're doing often months in advance from 6 a.m. to you know, midnight. We have planned everything. And no surprise, many people rely on going on vacations just to have some kind of happiness in their life, or people rely on going out and drinking themselves into a stupor. It's, it's the common thing because we are so not built. I firmly believe we're not built as a human being genetically to live in such a rigid, structured way. Um, so as a result, we control everything. The only way you can function in a way where everything is so controlled in your daily life is to control everything, is to not allow yourself emotional freedom. But this is not you being human, actually. It, a human being naturally has all these emotions that arise. And yes, we need to manage them, but trying to control them to me is a problem. Because if you're trying to control them, you're not really honoring what's happening with you. It's very interesting in Tibetan Buddhism, in, in which is you could know as the Tantra, really. Um, Tibetan Buddhism is a form called the Vajrayana, which is under the purview of Tantra. Has to be said, just quickly for those listening, that Tantra does not mean in this context the whole modern version of kind of sex stuff. I mean, this is not real Tantra. This is what's called Neo-Tantra. Good that you're clarifying that. Yeah, <laughs> it's important. Tantra as a system is very interesting. The, the, over, the basic view of Tantra, and Tantra exists both in Hinduism and Buddhism. Tantra as a system is very modern in a way. What Tantra says is that everything that happens to you is important and has to be explored. Nothing is to be pushed away or ignored or controlled or changed. Everything is to be 100% explored and felt. The example I often give, quite an amusing example I think, is um, in this context to show you how this works, is, is a bit like Buddhism developed in three main big blocks, you could say, over many hundreds of years. And the first beginning of the Buddhist world, you, you had this uh, system where whenever we felt an emotion that we didn't want, we try to cultivate the opposite. That was the early Buddhism. For example, you feel intense anger for someone, you cultivate love. And the funny example that I really quite enjoy in a kind of cheeky way sharing is um, that a big problem, of course, often for the Buddhist monks who are celibate generally in most systems is having desires for sex. And the early Buddhists would be asked to cultivate a sense of revulsion toward the object of their affection. There's two main ways you do this. There's the stages of decomposition of a corpse. We literally imagine your object of desire as a dead body and visualize going through the different stages of decomposing. <laughs> yeah, you told me that one like the other <laughs> yeah. time, right? Yeah. And yeah. the other one, the other one that I quite enjoy is um, that you are asked to really, really not just get stuck in the, your beloved's attributes, whether it's their nice abs or their nice breasts or whatever you like. Um, it's actually realizing, okay, this person has a really nice body, as it were, but look deeper, there's mucus, there's poo traveling through intestines, there's pus coming out, there's sweat dripping off the armpits. And, you know, so you're trying to cultivate revulsion by seeing the whole body, not just the bits that you like. So that's the old school view. Not really my approach, uh -huh. actually, not okay. at all. all right. But it's, it's quite entertaining to, to, to look uh -huh. at. And actually many people do that. It's like, I feel this, I don't want to feel this, I'm going to cultivate the opposite. In a way, that's quite a commonly done thing today right? in many systems. It is. It I is, don't want yeah. this, I'll yeah. do this instead. Yeah. But to me, it's quite limited in that way because we'll go into the others and you see why. So the second outpouring of Buddhism, we call the Mahayana, the great vehicle it's known as, um, the grandiose title, but it's quite different. And one of the key teachings of that form is the teaching that there is nothing ultimately substantial or real or lasting. Everything is constantly shifting and changing and moving. And it's teaching of shunyata, often called emptiness. But it's not that. It's, it's, it's less than emptiness. It's just that everything is constantly playful and shifting and changing. And you can't pin anything down. So the monk who has a sexual desire working within that outpouring of Buddhism is asked to see through his desire or her desire as purely being empty of anything lasting or real. 
So you start to really feel, this happens in meditation practice actually, you start to really feel like actually, yeah, I feel this desire now, but it'll be gone like a flash in a moment. And you approach your life like that. So every emotion that arises, you don't try to control it or try to bring the opposite. You just see it as being nothing important. It's just one of the many things that comes and goes, comes and goes, and you just get on with your task. I see, I see. Okay, so this can be applicable to uh, anyone wanting to deal with the emotions, is yeah. dealing with them. Well, it's, it's okay. It takes some serious training because yeah. you can't just think your way through it, mm. but it's learning to actually literally feel like, wow, everything is transitory. Nothing is real. Nothing is lasting. Everything is, is empty of anything ultimately lasting. Uh -huh. But I'll just quickly, it's okay, I'll quickly finish this because then, then it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But again, that's not the way that I find the modern person can most helpfully engage with emotions. The tantric view comes next. The tantric view, the Vajrayana view is very different. The tantric view says to us, okay, this is the emotion that you feel. This is what you're experiencing. Great. Don't push it away. Don't see it as empty. Feel the emotion as closely as you can. Treat it as a trusted friend coming to give you a message. Treat it as a lover trying to communicate to you. Very different. Mm. So for example, you suddenly feel all this anger and rage. You don't feel guilty or bad about yourself. You don't sit there and try to cultivate love. You don't try to see it as empty. Instead, you sit with the feeling. You feel the emotion. You explore it. You wear it in the body. What does it feel like? You don't act on it. Either, either mentally or physically, you don't act on it. You don't do something about it. The anger, you don't suddenly go and punch a punching bag. You don't, in your head, create a big yelling scenario. You yell at the person you're angry at. You just sit there and feel the emotion. You don't repress it either. You don't push it away. You just let it have its own life. And you sit and feel that life of the emotion running its course. If you feel sexual desire, you don't fantasize. You don't go and have sex with someone. You don't push it away. I shouldn't be having this feeling. You just sit and feel the desire feel it, feel it, feel it, feel it. And then you find that even if you can sustain your attention on emotional content for even a matter of two or three minutes, it changes. It does, okay. Yeah, um, it completely changes. Yeah. I remember vividly many times being on meditation retreat and meditating and huge emotion comes up and being trained in this approach, I just sit there and feel whatever's arising with a kind of curiosity. And then before long it's changed. The charge is often gone. Uh, there's been moments where intense jealousy and anger and betrayal has turned into pure bliss and joy in the matter of seconds. So when you say you sit with it and you think about it or feel it, feel it yeah. uh, are you also in the same time thinking and asking yourself, throwing questions there, like why is it that way and what, where does it come from? Trying to understand it? Maybe later. Just, uh, Maybe later. At the time, though, when it's first happening, I, it's like the first thing you do is just stop and listen. It's like, okay, let's say a good friend is sitting with you and telling you uh, a really horrible thing that happened to them yesterday. You know, say they got mugged, they got all their money stolen, they're really upset. You don't straight away say, okay, let's figure this out. Why did this happen to you? Maybe you should be more careful next time. Mm -hmm. It's not helpful. No. The first thing you need to do is let them have their grief, let them have their upset. They maybe just need you to give them a hug. Maybe just need you to listen to them and to tell the story. And then after their emotional content has settled down, then you can talk to them. And say, okay, this happened maybe because you're walking down a dark alley on your own and you are carrying your bag freely. Maybe that's why it happens. Maybe next time we can be more careful. And then it might be helpful, yeah. But the, the root cause cannot be attached right away, attacked right away. It has to be first felt. So it's like you let the emotional situation run its course. You let the train wreck do its thing. And then once the dust has settled, why did this happen? Mm. And then you can do the work that a therapist would do, that you could do using your own intuition. You can talk with friends about whatever you want to do. But then you would do the work of trying to discover the root cause. Why is this happening to me? Mm. But when you're in the middle of an emotional episode, that's the worst thing you can do because you're not thinking clearly anyway. All you can do, and the stronger the emotion, the more important this is, all you can do is learn the skill of being with the emotion, just like you can treat the emotion like the friend that is described, the friend that's just telling you this horrible thing that happened to you. And that goes for all emotions, whether it's pure joy or pure lust or rage, or even if it's just sometimes we go through these periods where we feel blank, we don't feel anything. That's also emotion. Mm. So it's a kind of blankness. And the key thing is to learn to, when I say sit with it, what I mean is 
All we're doing is feeling the emotional content of the situation. We're not doing anything. Can you try to identify where it resides in the body, for example? That's I often feel, really helpful. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's really helpful yeah. often. Because it's, it's grounding the work in the body also very, also and always very crucial. So you feel the huge rage. Often a way you can learn to stay with it is learning to stay with the physical components of it. Mm. Like often rage for many people is a kind of tightening in the belly or a kind of upward surge in the spine. Often sadness and grief is a kind of heaviness in the shoulders, a kind of slumping in the chest. And you can learn to really feel how those things are. And often by learning to stay with the physical sensations, you then learn to stay with the emotional content as well. It's kind of one and the same. And can this strategy uh, or technique be used, let's say, uh, under um, pressure moments? I'm thinking here about, okay, somebody who has to do a speaking thing, mm -hmm. like a public speaking, and yeah. he's feeling intense emotions going through his body and his mind, heart, or someone who's just right about to uh, compete in a, mm -hmm. on a surf competition and... Yeah. He knows yeah, that yeah. there's eyes on him, there's uh, pressure from his coaches, uh, fans, mm. and sponsors. Or is there, I mean, it feels like the one you're describing right now is something that could be, I mean, you said uh, within two, three minutes it can vanish, mm. but it seems to me like something that can be used to learn to cope with emotions and understand them and feel them and actually help with them on the long term. Yeah, but, I see what you're saying. But in the short term, can it be working also? Like, okay, now I need to feel better. Yeah, but the thing is, my, my challenge is, do you have to feel better? It's like, okay, again, we go back to Buddhism again because so we're yeah. talking about this. But um, sure. the Buddha once, uh, I'm not going to give the exact quote, but it'll be close, um, was once asked, I love this, this is so actually exactly what you're talking about. He was asked once, well, when you go meditate in the forest, don't you get scared? Because, of course, especially old India, we're talking a couple of thousand years ago, the forest was Tigers. pretty wild. <laughs> Tigers, bandits, <laughs> snakes. It's pretty dangerous there, pretty dangerous. Place. He imagine. would just sit by himself in the middle of the forest. I mean, you know, a guy sitting in the forest alone is kind of asking for trouble, right? <laughs> so um, he was asked, well, what do you do when you get scared? And he said, of course I feel fear. But when the fear comes upon me and I'm sitting down, I stay sitting down. When the fear comes upon me and I'm standing up, I continue to stand When the fear comes upon me and I'm lying down, I just stay lying down. When the fear comes upon me and I'm walking, I continue to walk. So it's like what the training is, is learning to stay with the emotion. But in terms of daily life application, you start to actually do this bizarre thing where you realize it's all just stuff going on in you and doesn't have to affect you. Weirdly, you can still, you can have this, you know, you can talk to thousands of people And inside, there's all these stress and stuff and all these voices saying, you can't do this or you want to run away, but you just get on with it. <laughs> and you're not pushing away the feelings. The worst thing you can do is try to push them away. You just, you just, they're just there. You know, they're just there. And we all have these inner critics. We all have these things. We just get on with it. We just do the talking while feeling the stuff. And then if it's debilitating, then you need to do some work, like I've talked about or seeing a therapist or figuring out the root cause. But... Um, I find it's funny. I mean, I've worked a lot in front of people and I'm naturally quite an introvert and quite a shy person, although that people often don't realize that about me um, because I'm quite outgoing when I teach. But it's funny. So often I've gone to teach and recently I've gone through some really difficult personal stuff. I don't really want to go into now, but um, not really the forum for it. But um, in my personal life, it's been quite challenging. And um, many times I would go and teach and I don't feel good. I feel like I want to run away. I want to go and cry somewhere. But the funny thing is, I'm here right now to teach you guys. I'm not here right now to sit there and feel terrible and get stuck in my own neurosis. <laughs> so I recognize I'm feeling terrible right now. The feeling is there, but I'm still doing the thing of being with my students, of working through the sequence. And actually, my teaching, I feel, has been pretty good the last few months, even though it's been imbued with emotional challenge. It's a business as usual, still teaching, still being there, being present with people. So it's like, it's almost like a different world. You have this internal world of all this crazy stuff, but that's not what I'm here to do right now. I'm, right now I'm here to give you a class and be with you guys. And if that's still there when I finish, I can then work with it. 
Does that make sense? It does make sense. So what I'm picking there is that emotions can come. They can be there. You change actually your relationship to the emotions, how you see them, the perspective yes. on, uh, uh, okay, they are there, but I'm not afraid of from them. I don't want to push them away. Mm. Uh, I'm just acknowledging them. And actually I know that they can vanish at some point somehow, yeah. right? Yeah, and having something to do, like let's say for example, the public speaking or the competition that the athlete has to do or the teaching that you were doing, mm. It's, uh, yeah, focusing on that and trying to deliver as much as, as good as possible because there's a higher purpose. There's a, a better reason uh, to actually move, move forward and keep on doing yeah. what you've been doing. Yeah. Right. It's in a way, it's quite yeah. funny because actually that skill, I think, comes from meditation. If, if you ever practice meditation mm -hmm. and it's worth looking at, if, especially if you're doing anything like competing in, in, in professional sports mm -hmm. or, or working at a high level public speaking arena, I mean, then the training meditation becomes, I think, very, very helpful for everyone, but especially in those contexts, professionally speaking. Because really the key skill in meditation is learning to pay attention to one thing and letting everything else fall away. That's really mm -hmm. the key skill. Mm -hmm. And whether your teacher or the practice you're following, the paying attention to the whole body or to the breath, or to a mantra, which is a kind of imagined sound syllable, or whatever meditation system you're following, it's the same thing. Say you're using breath meditation, which is one of the most common ones. You sit there and you follow the breath, either in the whole body or the tip of the nose or the lower belly. You're just following the breath. What we are learning there, you learn pretty quickly when you're meditating. If you bring your energy into trying to push away the thinking mind or distractions, it's not going to work. It doesn't work. We get tired, we get kind of grumpy, we fall asleep, or we just feel like meditation doesn't work for me. Instead, what we do is try to bring more energy, more mental energy into the breath. So instead of trying to get lost in making distractions stop, we instead try to heighten the sense of the breath. And we bring a stronger and stronger sense of focus and purpose into the breath itself. Now, the obvious life skill you get from that is you can bring it to anything if you're competing. Yeah, you notice there's all these distractions. There's all this emotional stuff that comes up. Suddenly you feel trauma arising. You're about to do a, you know, a big sprint for an Olympic context and suddenly you feel traumatized and you feel like there's an emotion that kind of asks for your attention. Through meditation, you learn to not push it away, but you just, this is not what I'm doing now. Now I'm running. Mm. And you bring all of your focus into that. Right. And then when it's done, then you can attend, if you still need to, to the emotion. Mm. So in that way... You know, there's, there's, there's countless stories of, of, of advanced meditators in all traditions. You know, one of those common things you find, and I've seen this myself in action a little bit, uh, very old, often very sick, lifelong meditators who are, you know, on the deathbeds. And even though they must be in tremendous pain, you can't tell. They're happy, they're talking to their students, and every now and again you might see a shadow of pain across their eyes and then it goes again. And they're sitting there probably in excruciating pain, but that's not what they're doing now. <laughs> what they're doing now is talking to their student. And the pain is just kind of bubbling away in the background. So meditation gives us that. And that's, mm. I think, one of the key skills all yoga tries to give us, to be able to turn our awareness where we need to in that moment. Right now, say you're having a big, an important conversation. Okay, good example. You've just had a breakup, big breakup. You feel like hell. You feel awful. You just found out your partner's cheating on you or whatever. And you have a huge business meeting in half an hour. You go to the business meeting and yeah, you're going to be feel, feeling awful. But through the meditative training and through the approach of the yogis, you learn actually it is very possible to 100% be with this person I'm having this big meeting with. And in my belly, these emotions are rolling around. But not what I'm doing now. Right now, I'm doing this. I'm having this conversation with this business businessman, businesswoman, having this meeting. And then, actually, you realize, I'm fine. It's not that you're pushing away your bad feeling. You just, right now, this is not what I'm doing. Mm. This is what I'm doing. And later, you pick it up again. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And uh, actually, this is specifically what I tell uh, my clients and why I do meditation also. Um, to simplify it to some of my clients who are, let's say, having a little bit of a negative stigma around meditation, I tell them it's focus training. Yeah. You train yourself to focus on certain things yeah. and deal with emotions in mm. a different way. And yeah, it's, it's very, very interesting. I'm a big fan of meditation, by the way. I know you are. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Practice almost every day also. Okay. So is your job, um, 
is it as nice as it looks like from the outside? Or are there <laughs> <laughs> challenging question. moments in it? Of course, there are there challenging yeah. moments. Yeah. Um, well, like anything, I mean, the thing is, the thing about teaching yoga um, and teaching anything, I feel, is there's no hiding. And like I mentioned, sometimes the last thing I'm going to be doing is talking to people because I'm going through some big emotional stuff or mm. even I just wake up really tired and then you think, oh, I don't want to do this, but you haven't got a choice. It's like I can sit behind my computer and do some work. I have to go and be with these people. Um, so that's a challenging aspect. Mm. Um, not a problem for me. I, as I mentioned, I've, I've picked up the skills to be able to do that. But of course, it's tough. And, and mm. physically also, just the physical aspect of, of doing that. I do quite a few classes a week and then really having to be that physically engaged in that way all the time um, is challenging. I guess another challenge is what I call yoga fatigue. And what I mean by that is that if I'm practicing three to four hours a day, sometimes more, sometimes up to six, sometimes less, but usually three to four um, of various disciplines, yoga, meditation, breath work. And then I teach for three, four, five hours a day, sometimes less, sometimes more. And then I want to do some study and reading, listen to a podcast from my teachers or something. I'm just like, oh my God, I'm sick of this. <laughs> I'm sick of talking about this. I'm sick of doing it. I'm sick mm. of, of hearing about it. Where's my chess? Let me play a game of chess. Let me read a novel. Mm. So, so that side of things, it starts to, to feel like um, the old problem that when you make your passion also your, your, your job, it, it can start to feel like work. Mm. And those moments I'm very careful of. That's actually one of the main reasons I've decided to uh, change my working situation next year because I'm wary of the fact that I don't want this to be just a job. This is very much a vocation for me and I want it to remain a vocation, not just a job. Mm. Yeah, it makes sense. So this is how you expected it to be when you started? No. no In no, fact, I never, no. again, I never meant to teach full time. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, I started teaching full time eight years ago now, I realized. Mm. Um, Part time for a lot longer, as I mentioned. Um, I never meant it to happen. It just kind of happened. I suddenly realized one day that actually the acting was based on erroneous assumptions. I was doing it for the wrong reasons. Um, and my passion really lay in the yoga. Mm. So then I was offered some great jobs and great studios in Shanghai and now Bali and just thought, yeah, okay, let's do this. Right. So it never really meant to happen that way. Yeah. And are you satisfied from what I have accomplished so far? Never satisfied. <laughs> Never satisfied. But like, what's the number there? Like 10 being super satisfied, one not being satisfied at all. On the positive side? pretty hard on myself. Mm, pretty hard on myself. Four, mm. five, six. Four, five, six. How would a nine look like? Mm. Paint it. Okay. A nine might look like? Emphasizing on the look and the vision. Uh, on how it looks in terms of daily Yeah, like, uh, okay. yeah, what are you doing? Yeah. Where okay. are you? What are you hearing? Yeah. What are you seeing I've, around you? I've written a few books. I've created a big website. I've um, created some online content people can follow at home. Uh, I have reached a mass of people in terms of helping them find more happiness and peace in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not just reaching yogis. I'm reaching athletes, business people, government people. Um, these kinds of things are what I want to head toward. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at even, I mean, running corporate retreats, not just yoga retreats, where running seminars, mm -hmm. teaching someone who's never had an interest in yoga in their life mm -hmm. some of the key principles of the yogic world to help their life unfold more harmoniously and enjoyably to bring more care into this world for each other, all these things. Mm -hmm. So that's why, I mean, I've got a great job teaching where I teach is wonderful and I love where I teach, but it feels limited because I'm only getting the yogis. Mm. I was gonna ask you what stopped you from actually already being that nine here, meeting that vision. Mm. I think that's a lot of my old trauma stuff. I mean, I have a lot of issues around security and safety and, and, mm. and, and, and fear around not having enough, mm. which I'm currently tackling in my own practice and my, yeah. own, my own development. And what can stop you now from actually making it happen? Uh, nothing really. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, so what are you up to actually? You, okay, so you mentioned a couple of times that you're changing, there's some change coming. Next yeah. year is different than this year. Yeah. What, what are you up to? Well, I spent the last seven years working full-time for studios. One year before that, working full-time as a freelancer. And I'm basically opening the door next year by having left my current place of full-time employment. A really great place called Desa Seni in, in Bali. A wonderful place. Um, and I'll keep recommending it to people. It's a great place. But um, looking at more working with running 
trainings for teachers. So teaching teachers, mm-hmm. doing a lot more of that. I do that already, but doing that more. Mm-hmm. I'm already doing one in January with someone. I've got a few more people I'm talking to about that. Um, also running retreats, meditation and yoga retreats. And those are kind of the two things I've started already the ball rolling on. I've got a few things booked in that way already, um, especially the first half of the year. But then using the, at least from what I can see, I'm hoping so far, the more free time that I have to start creating content, to start creating um, the stuff that I'm talking about, reaching a wider group of people, creating content that is looking at working with the corporate world, looking at working with the athlete, looking at working with those people, um, looking at working... um, in a way that reaches a wider audience. Um, and that is through, you know, putting together a website, putting together some video content, starting to maybe even look at app development. I mean, all these kind of things I'm currently toying with and playing with. So still I have to always make a living and also what I do, I still I want to keep doing. But if I do bigger chunks of trainings and more free time in between these things, I've actually got time and bandwidth in the mind left to create stuff to write something, to maybe write a book, whatever. I mean, these are the kind of things I'm looking at. So spend more time doing intensive work for a month or two at a time than having a month or two where I don't do so much. And in that month or two where I don't do so much, spend my time wisely creating something. That's what next year kind of looks like at the moment. Right, right. That sounds very exciting. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hope you're going to be still around in Bali, though. Because, I'll be here. I'll be here. Yeah, right? Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> I've already had so many students ask me the same questions, so I've started to put together a little list of emails, and I'm going to probably run two three classes a week if i can find a space to do it yeah and you know that'll just be for those who want to keep working in my classes so two or three classes a week i'll happily do just not 10 or 12 or 15. Yeah, so you can make room for <laughs> the other things right yeah yeah exactly that makes little sense right well that was really really interesting i'm pretty sure that a lot of the listeners here have took lessons from what actually you shared in a practical way but also from your own experience and what was your aspirations and how you approached things to learn and keep on learning. Thank you. Um, uh, can you finish the following sentences? Ah, okay. <laughs> Life is all about... <laughs> Finding fulfillment from the deepest possible level within oneself and then sharing that with others. Fantastic, beautiful. Happiness come from... I'm not going to say the same thing. <laughs> it is the same uh, thing? It is, it is kind of the same thing, but okay. let's, 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 let me think about that for a second. Yeah. Happiness comes from finding your ultimate purpose of what actually most fulfills you. It's the same sort of thing, I guess. Right. Okay. Beautiful. Beautiful. Is there anything you would like to add uh, to this uh, conversation? <laughs> Well, I always really enjoy the, I mean, the final words of the Buddha, uh, where as he was on his deathbed, um, he was, he gave one last bit of advice and that was with mindfulness, strive on. And then he died. <laughs> really? That's what he <laughs> yeah. said. Fantastic. Yeah. Wonderful. And that's really, to me, what life is about. Uh, be I'll, clear, be aware, and then just go for it. Go for your life. Live 100%. Excellent. For a second, I thought you were going to tell us, okay, let's one last um, all together. <laughs> no, no, no. With mindfulness, strive on. Excellent. Words to live by. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. Thank you, that was, Thank you so much. That was great. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you. Great to be with you. That's it for today's conversation. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the key insights that we shared on this podcast interview. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you didn't subscribe yet and head to my website, thebodyandmindcoach.com slash blog to find exclusive articles about various personal and professional development topics. And finally, if you are an athlete or a business professional who's looking for help to advance your career and navigate through whatever challenges that you may be facing to win your game, or if you are a corporate organization who would like to offer their team a workplace well-being workshop, or if you are a sports team who's looking at unlocking their full potential, go to my website, thebodyandmindcoach.com, scroll to the bottom and hit the contact button and reach out. Thank you and enjoy your day.